Welcome to episode 478 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with... Grace Winburn. And Michael O'Malley. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about movies that we saw this week in part one. And in part two, we're going to be making a last minute change on the movie. Um, initially, we were going to see, we were going to watch The Nightingale's Prayer, but uh, that is in, in, insanely difficult to find, as we discovered. Uh, not very accessible for English language uh, viewers, though Grace may have tracked something down that could help us. Um, but. Uh, we are switching that going to switch out that movie for 1954's Sancho the Bailiff, which um, I realized is our third Mizuguchi movie that we've done. Um, what are the, the other two? I was, the Last Chrysanthemum was one. What was and, the other uh, one? Ugetsu. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I still, I feel like, I don't know how y'all feel. I feel like Mizuguchi gets a little, gets a little slept on when it comes to like the, you know, they they go classic Japanese filmmakers. They go Kurosawa. They go Ozu. I feel like Mizuguchi is probably the third guy, but um, maybe probably not as like wild. And the other one that make me don't feel bad. You know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, he's he's like very movies much movies that don't make one. me feel hollowed out in my soul. That's yeah. true. This was my That's first true. one, so I I I have I'm very oh awesome yeah. So it's a good one to start with. Um, Ugetsu and the Chrysanthemum, also depressing, but in other ways. <laughs> um, well, cool. Let's go ahead and, and jump into movies that we saw this week. Um, because we were contractually obligated to only talk about Pinocchio movies last episode, uh, Michael, we did not get to talk about the new Richard Linklater movie. So I'm going to let's oh. jump into Hitman. Yeah. Now on Netflix, un unfortunately, this would have killed in the theater. Um. But yeah, do you want me to do you want me to introduce it? Okay, so this new Richard Linklater movie, um, and uh, stars Glenn Powell, friend of the pod, Glenn Powell, um, and uh, Glenn Powell is a guy who work. He he's like a he teaches like at a community college, uh, like philosophy. He's like a philosophy professor, um, but he moonlights as a uh, like a guy who. So I didn't know this before I watched the movie, but apparently the concept of a hitman, as we are familiar with it in the movies, where you like meet a guy like in a parking garage and give him a sack of money and he goes and kills someone. Apparently that's not real. And that's not how it really works if you want to kill someone in real life, uh, which is disappointing. Um, but, but apparently because so many people think it's real, the police have found that it's useful to keep that facade going. And so Glenn Powell uh, basically poses as hitman and able to, in order to like entrap people into like confessing their plans to murder to the police. Um, and uh, so he's like moonlighting is that. And uh, early on in the movie, he kind of breaks uh, like a rule, not a rule of his job, but he kind of like breaks an ethical line in his job by basically instead of trying to um, get the person, the, this woman to um, admit her plan of murdering her husband, he talks her out of trying to murder her husband. Um, and as a result, the two kind of like, have a relationship and so the movie in addition to being this kind of like silly it is silly there's a lot of funny like glenn powell hats and and hairdos um but in addition to being that it becomes this kind of rom-com uh thing uh that eventually kind of morphs into a little bit of like a thriller aspect as like the um implications of their relationship kind of catch up to them and glenn powell um his like secret identity is working for the police kind of catches up with him as well because he uh, does not give up the ruse that he's not a real hitman uh, to the woman. Um, by the way, who is played by um, Adria Arjona? Arjona? I don't know how... I'm not familiar with that actress. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right. But uh, So he's kind of like pretending he's still a hitman to her, but a hitman with a heart of gold because he talked her out of killing her husband, um, ex-husband. Um, anyway, I thought this was a great time. Uh it's a lot of fun. It's like Linklater working in that kind of like uh, school of rock, you know, main, this is like mainstream Hollywood, like one for the studio Linklater uh, mode, which I think can be really charming at times, even if it's not like as like, um, you know, not as distinctive as like something like Boyhood or Dazed and Confused or something. But I thought this was really 
a ton of fun. Glenn Powell is like killing it. Um, and uh, it's also like surprisingly like ethically thorny um, because of like the the movie's kind of glib approach to uh, what Glenn Powell does, which I think like, I don't know. The more I've thought about the movie, the more it seems like that's kind of a bad job to have from an ethical standpoint is rather than help people who are trying to murder people, like help them get out of the murder, he's going to entrap them and put them in jail. I don't know. That seems like, I don't know. Um, and the movie kind of like just pushes it to its logical extreme. Um, and the ending of this movie is kind of wild, to be honest. Um, but uh, I had a good time with it. Um, and I think that the ethically thorny stuff makes sense now that I'm reflecting over it, because every time Glenn Powell is teaching a philosophy class, he's talking about ethics and stuff. So it seems to have been like the intention of the movie to like do something like morally freighted um, with his character. Anyway, Zach, what did you think? Um, well, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm pretty in the bag at this moment for anything. Glenn Powell. Um, I even watched uh, anyone but you, which terrible is terrible movie, but Glenn Powell's good in it. Not a good movie. Not a good movie at all. But not Glenn Powell good. is really good in it. Um, he good. Like he's just like the dude. The dude's got the movie star stuff. Um, really, really, really excited to be seated for Twisters in a few weeks. Very excited <laughs> for that. Like I'm going to be in. Um, yeah, this one's fun. I, uh, you know, Link Ladder, it's, uh, I wouldn't say like Link Ladder's had like a, a, a bad spill of it. He's more just been like, he's been a little, like he's been working with Netflix a lot. And yeah, like, like this movie, yeah, he had that like NASA movie for Netflix a few years ago. And it was good, but like, you it, was know, good, it, yeah. it was good, but like it got lost on Netflix. And like, that's the kind of, I hope mm-hmm. that I hope meet people like so, watch Tit man. It seemed like according to the fake Netflix data, it seemed like it was, it did well, but like, I agree. Like this would have been an inc- incredible, like, um, let's toss it in a movie theater one weekend. Um, maybe it doesn't like, which it, I don't think that this could survive because it would probably do like, okay, the first weekend, but would be purely word of mouth where people like start going yeah. to see it over. And like, they put the, it on VOD in like week three or something. Yeah. Something like, like, like it would like by week three or four, it would start really growing because people would be like, Oh, have you seen that movie? You know? Um, and so at the same time, I'm just kind of like, I, I don't know if it would survive in a, in a physical movie theater, but, um, it's it's just a it's like a really fun time. It's I think a lot of people have pointed to it's a it's a it's a pretty sexy movie. Like you got Glenn Powell and um and Adria Arjona like like getting getting it on a lot like and they're just two really attractive hot people, um, which which is it's it's nice to see. You don't you know you kind of especially with a lot of like more like blockbustery fare like all the characters are so like you know, non like we're not going to have any kind of sexual relation whatsoever. It's kind of nice to see like actual human beings, like in like characters that are actual humans kind of thing. Um, also though, that was kind of the premise of anyone, but you is like, you think Sydney Sweeney's hot. You think Glenn Powell's hot. Well, they're in a relationship and that yeah. movie sucked. So there is a way to like fumble that. It's but true. This movie does not. This, this movie does not. Um, but it also, you know, it also a little bit kind of like jumps around for me um like the highlights the highlights of it are like the montage when you get like glenn powell doing the different oh my gosh he's got so many good good moments in those montages yeah it's just like a montage and he's like dressing up and appearing as like different hitman hitmen in different situations and so like it's fun in that little like 30 to 45 second clip to see him like interacting with the person like with it with some goofy accent or some goofy like eye patch or like hat on or like there's this one where he kind of seems like he's doing like half tilda swinton half javier bardem and no country for old men (laughs) like it's just it's a a really absurd like you're just like yeah this like you can tell he's having like like a hell of a time doing this um and so like on that level, it, it, it really works for me. It also, it kind of gives me a little bit of like out of sight vibes. Um, yeah. Like, big time out of sight. You know, it's, it's just kind of like, like, you know, you got the bat, you know, bad, bad guy, uh, good person, you know, like they're, they're attracted to each other. Cause they're both, you know, smoking hot. Like I kind of li- like, I like that, like that vibe to it. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really good time. I think this is a perfect like summer movie. 
you have like you know glenn powell definitely gives like a movie star performance but also adria arjan like is really really good like countering him you know like i was thinking about it more after watching anyone but you where i just felt like sydney sweeney had like zero chemistry Dude, with him like zero. Was, how did that happen like just like oh. rock at the bottom of the of the pond type chemistry with him and like that's not the case in this like even even with its shortcomings like this is a super charming and like fun movie because like the two of them are like firing at high gears um so yeah, yeah. if you have not I watched also, this on netflix check it out i also think that like specifically about link later he goes through these kind of like periods where people seem to like kind of forget about him or take him for granted because he's not producing like the the big attention getting things like the before yeah. trilogy or or boyhood or whatever but um he's so good with actors that like all of his movies have this kind of like baseline watchability to them because like actors always give like great performances for mm -hmm. link later and i think that makes him really suitable to being kind of like a people don't really appreciate these movies from him usually but he's really good i think at like the hall like hired gun like studio like journeyman type films um, even though those are the, not the ones that people tend to like gravitate toward with him and like they're not all amazing but like even like some of his like 90s ones were like like after days and confused when he did some of those like the newton boys or things like that they aren't very good mm -hmm. like they're all still kind of watchable because um i don't know i don't know what it's like on his sets but it must be a really pleasant experience because everyone always seems to like be really uh really dialed in to just at least like good vibes in his movies um and so like even though this is not like a high concept or like art house kind of movie like a lot of people associate with like Linklater's bigger stuff but i think that it is still better than like just your random like kind of like a studio like genre pick or direct to netflix sort of yeah. thing uh just because of that um that energy he gets from the performances that i think is underappreciated from him yeah no definitely um it, it, it this definitely feels like a step up from like the other like random netflix movies that come out like i'm thinking about like that atlas movie that starred jennifer lopez that i know we've all watched because netflix said that like two billion I, people watched this is it. the first i'm hearing about it yeah <laughs> yeah no it was like for like a month straight it was allegedly the most watched thing on netflix um that, and like but like that, like what like it like, i don't know like granted we're, we we kind of live in a much more like movie geared like we run in those circles but like what's the cultural impact of this random jennifer lopez movie that dropped on netflix that like people it's not like people are talking about it it's not like people are like you know like like sharing memes or like you know like going like oh like this is i just love this movie i've seen more of that about furiosa which allegedly bombed than this jennifer lopez movie so like i like with this one i don't know if it'll make a cultural impact but it seems like people at least are like tuning into i feel like glenn powell it's it's leading glenn powell to kind of have a cultural moment this summer yeah i think the best thing that could happen for Glenn Powell is a little bit more like saturation and hopefully like twisters will get him that. Cause he seems like right on the cusp of like being a bigger name than he is yeah. um, right now. Also though, I hope he still works with the uh, link later. Cause he was in everybody wants some uh, really good. In that and he was really good in that. Like that, I think that was the first time I had seen him in a movie. Right. Um, so hopefully this is like, an ongoing like fruitful relationship between him and link later he, he didn't leave as much of a of an impression as the random finance person on wall street in the dark knight rises who bane beats up <laughs> wait is he in that yeah there's the scene when he goes in like the little like finance place and there's and like glenn powell's like in a suit and he like beats him against the, t the table and like is like taken over i'd like to imagine that that's the same character as the one he plays in anyone but you because isn't he like a finance bro or something in it's anyone true but you? yeah it could Crossover be the same there. person yeah is anyone but he's really a batman movie <laughs> um well yeah hitman's on netflix um uh, i'm gonna talk real briefly about another new release and that is the bike riders which i didn't realize is the first movie from jeff nichols in like eight or nine years um uh, midnight what special last... midnight didn't special that, uh loving versus virginia movie yeah, but that became that came out after or before Midnight oh, Special. Oh, it did. Okay, never mind. And so he's just—I don't know if like he was in director jail. I—I I, I didn't look deeply, like, or if he was like on in TV or something. I don't know. It was like 
he was always I, I wasn't a giant fan of all of his movies but they never were like bad they're all pretty watchable um they're pretty you know they have good they got good performances in them um but this one bike riders it's uh based on i don't remember if the book is of the same name but it's by danny leon um, who followed this biker gang out of um, Chicago between like 1965 and early 1970s. Um, and they have a character for him. It's a little, it's, 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 I'll, I'll get into it in a second, but pretty much the story is about this biker gang. Um, you meet them through uh, Kathy, who is played by Jodie Comer, who is somewhat of, the the narrator for the story because she is being interviewed by the Danny Leon character played by Mike Feist. I don't know if he even shares the same name. He does, yeah. Um, Mike Feist from Challengers. He's playing the Leon character who's kind of interviewing people about the the group, you know, along the way. Um, but Jodie Comer is kind of like it's this is like late sixties, early seventies, and she's kind of like talking, like recounting the events of like how this biker gang happened. Um, and you, you meet her because she is romantically involved with Benny, who is the Austin Butler character who honestly, speaking of like movie star, like movie star performances, like has a very like movie star, um, like opening where like she comes into this, like into this bar and he's like playing pool and it's just shot. Like you like, it's, it's very, you know, we talked a couple of weeks ago about, john wayne and stagecoach where like the light kind of hits him he's on that he's on the uh he's on the horse like very much like that where it's kind of like the light hits him and you're like this dude's like a this dude's a star kind of thing um even though he's been in a lot of stuff and i feel like people are starting to figure out who austin butler is um but this this motorcycle club that's uh called the vandals it's run by um johnny who's played by tom hardy who's god love him he's doing him he's doing an accent it's wonderful um there's a number of like other people like familiar people in this uh boyd holbrook is one of the bikers norman reedus shows up halfway through the movie in like a normous reedus way where you're like i don't think he was actually cast in this movie i think he just kind of showed up one day and they were like yeah you can be in the movie man um uh uh, uh michael shannon has like he only gets like a handful of moments but is one of the bikers and like gets he gets like three scenes where he just get, gets the kind of cook and he's really, really good. And I'm, I kind of just like, yeah, like Michael Shannon, like he's awesome. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit disjointed. You know, you're going, you have the Jodie Comer character kind of reliving this whole experience. Um, and you're kind of going through the ups and downs of this, of this gang, which kind of like starts out as like le people legitimately like interested in, motorcycles who like meet to race and hang out and drink and party and just like are just in that's like, like that's what they're into and then slowly over the years more you know as as people come back from like vietnam and stuff morphs into a much more like violent like becoming more of like a what you would stereotypically view as like a gang um with people be, you know with like the the fists and knives being replaced with like guns and and things of and uh things of that nature um and so like this this gang goes from about like 20 guys to like like maybe even hundreds like multiple chapters in different cities things like that um where and it just becomes kind of you, you know there's the, the point near the end of the movie where like tom hardy's you know without saying like i'm getting too old for this shit is kind of like i'm getting too old for this shit i can't be running running this motorcycle gang anymore um but yeah, Jeff Nichols always, like I said, like kind of similar to like Linklater, I think is somebody who can like tell, like tell, tell engaging, engaging, entertaining stories like that are not like IP that are, you know, for kind of that are you classify as kind of like big, big budget, like movies that play larger than you would think. I think Midnight Special was kind of built that way. But then you have stuff like Mud and Loving that I feel like are, are are very much like in the independent fair. This one feels like a nice morph between being an independent movie, but also being something that could probably have a little bit more wider appeal just because you have people like Tom Hardy and Austin Butler in it that might draw people in. Um, 
I think it kind of gets it gets a little bit lost in you know like it's at its best when uh it's at its best when it's a hangout movie it's at its best when it's like letting these main players the the you know it's letting these kind of characters be weird and be these like be these guys and just kind of like honestly just like be a hangout movie when it starts to kind of try and it, it it's trying a lot to like speak to you know mask american masculinity and in a lot of a lot a bunch of these larger issues but i never feel it kind of is always like happening like in the distance it never really like like head-on engages it really or at least head-on engages it in a way that kind of like sells that point to you it, it, it's 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 really like when they're like driving motorcycles and getting in fights and stuff like that's where it's fun and those are the those are the most engaging scenes um jody comer is really good also um she does like this really this really strong like uh midwest almost minnesota accent that's you forget that she's from england <laughs> a lot of the time um and uh there's a guy in the gang who's like johnny's number two who kind of looks like conan o'brien so like you've got everybody in the gang that you need you got an austin butler you got a tom hardy you got a conan o'brien you got a norman reedus that's a biker gang so i don't know it's fine it's not i'm not i'm not going to give you a like a, a, a high endorsement but it's also not like a waste of it's not a waste of time if you're if you're a fan of any of these people I wish Austin Butler got a little bit more like time to cook. It kind of like he gets the really strong movie star moment at the very beginning. And then it's kind of like, Hey, let's turn this over to Tom Hardy and get into the ins and outs and logistics of the spiker gang. Um, and that's where I think it kind of loses you a little bit. Like Austin Butler's really great at looking, looking attractive, smoking cigarettes and driving a motorcycle. So we should get more of that moment, but bike riders, it's uh, I think it's still in some theaters now, but it probably will be on VOD pretty soon. Um, so yeah, uh, Grace, we've talked way too long, so please, please save us. Not only, not that the two movies we talked about are bad, but you have the winner for best movie to talk about in this part. I think so. I watched uh, 1945's *Lever to Heaven*. That is. John M. Stahl as the director. That's got Gene Tierney, Gene or. Gene Cran and Vincent Price. And Vincent Price and Gene Tierney were in Laura together. They are electric together. They are such a great little duo. I don't know what it is, if it was like something in their contract that they have to be in movies together, but they play off of each other so well. Um, Leave Her to Heaven is the story of this beautiful woman played by Gene Tierney. And she meets this author on a train and there's an instant connection between the two of them. They're both traveling to the wide open spaces of New Mexico. It's gorgeous. This is also Technicolor and Jean Tierney has a face that was made for Technicolor. I think her face is the reason why um, movies were invented. Can you, um, can you imagine like Jean Tierney and like a, a Powell and Pressburger movie, like the Technicolor overload would be too much. I, I think it would be stunning and I think I would just do nothing but stare at her. But um, she plays Ellen. Um, there's her, her character. Ellen seems um, very sort of closed off, standoffish, um, very introspective, um, but still um, outgoing. She's the one that definitely commands all the attention in the family. Um Richard is uh, played by Cornell Wilde. He is the author and he immediately comes on to her. Um, of course, how could he not? Um, they connect um, because they both happen to be traveling to the same place, to the same family that is hosting them um, out in the desert. Um, and this wild romance, this whirlwind love affair takes over the two of them and um, they fall in love with each other do they really um that's kind of left up um up in the air um but there's very like a very palpable obsession uh, between the two and there's a lot to do with possession obsession um you know is it love is it what is it to control someone is it to manipulate someone um 
but this is a pretty chilling movie. I mean, I have such like noir brain when I watch certain movies that I was sort of right. I was certainly waiting for the other shoe to drop. I thought that um, Jean Tierney as Ellen, she always has something going on behind that gorgeous face, behind those eyes. And there seemed to be something a little conniving with how instantly she latches on to Richard and how he just kind of goes along with it. I mean, like he doesn't put up a fight because who's going to put up a fight against a gorgeous woman? She is forward and she has told you that she loves you after not really knowing you for very long, but they're, you know, who cares? You know, it's the forties. I guess everybody just threw caution to the wind and, you know, I guess that's just the way of the time, you know, you can meet someone and immediately um, develop a connection with them and, and don't look too closely at it. Um, but throughout the course of the movie, uh, Ellen's family starts to drop these little hints about how, well, that's just Ellen's way. That's just who she is. And um, she's always been um, sort of self-possessed and um, she gets what she wants. But how is that? Why is that? Um, and so over the course of the movie, this romance seems to turn a little sour and it takes Richard a while to sort of pick up on it. Um, there's there's murder, there's um, falling down the stairs for at-home abortion, there's poisoning, there's uh, drowning, there's um, this tumultuous love affair between um, Jean Cran's character and I forget her name, it escapes me. Also, quick side note, um, I had a hard time telling the difference between the two, between um, Jean Tierney and Jean Cran because they're both so gorgeous and they're both brunettes. So, and they're both in Technicolor. So it was a little hard to figure out um, who is who they look like twins. And um, so there's a little bit of a twist there with um, between main characters. Um, the standouts in this movie for me uh, was certainly, I mean, like I could go on and on. Jean Tierney is such like an underrated actress. She really, she has the range. She can play um, cool and aloof. She can play conniving and cold. She can play um, upbeat. She can play terrified and um, depressed. She can, I mean, like she can do it all. And um, so it's like, why, why weren't directors really reaching for her? I feel like in the same way as some of the other big name actresses, this came out in 45 and that's the same year as Mildred Pierce. And this was nominated, and so she was nominated for an Oscar as well, and we know how it turned out. We know that Joan Crawford won for Mildred Pierce, but you kind of wonder, like, you know, in the 40s, were they still, do, were they still doing, like, best black and white feature and best color feature? Like, maybe maybe there could have been room for both. Um, but she, she can really play um, anything that she wants and make her face... I mean, she says so much and does with so little. Um, another thing that stood out, the costumes in this. She has um, these color motifs of red is in almost everything that she wears. This like crimson, this like blood red. Um, and it gives her this really um, like carnal and alive feeling that a lot of the other characters don't have. They're kind of dressed, they're kind of styled um, safely so that she stands out. Um, plus, this is Technicolor, so everybody is just caked in Bin Nye makeup, like completely flawless, poreless skin. Everybody kind of glows. Um, and I also just really enjoyed, um, so it's called Lever to Heaven. And everything is so big. The, the set pieces are so big. They're out in the desert and you have these gorgeous, you know, rock formations and there's um, a giant swimming pool or is it a pond or some sort of oasis at this house. This house is this large ranch style home um, where, I mean, like everybody just sort of fits in so well, but there's still just so much more room around them. Um, then there's this cabin called Back of the Moon, which what a great name. I live out back of the moon. Um, that also really conjures up this sort of um, isolation and um, natural uh, or, or, or natural sort of backdrop. And it's it's way out in like the main forest, you know, landscape. 
Um, so, if, so everything is so isolated and natural and big and beautiful and larger to life. So you kind of like, these are heaven on earth. All of these places are heaven on earth and heaven on earth is certainly not a place with Ellen when she's got her sights set on you, because if she can't have you, no one can. And that's where um, things turn very dark. Um, I was not expecting this to go off the rails like it was. I, I was expecting something, some sort of crime of passion, but not where it went. I really don't want to spoil anything because I watched it like clutching, like hiding my face. Like I couldn't believe how calculating and how evil um, this beautiful woman could be. And like, isn't that like, that's tragedy that someone so beautiful could be so evil, but we've seen it time and time again and we eat it up and I love it. I mean, like, you know, at a certain, at like halfway through, I was like, God, she's just so beautiful. Like, I just, I can't stay mad at you, but it's true. You have true. to, you have to hold her accountable for the things that she does. And um, at the very end, yeah. at the end, yeah. um, things work themselves out after a fabulous courtroom um performance by Vincent Price he was firing on all on all cylinders what a talent I mean like he just he, he the camera loves him um leave it to heaven is available to check out at your local library and that's where I got it so check it out I like I like the most popular letterbox review is quote fuck them kids Ellen Harland after applying her lipstick it's two kids that she's killed. Um, if you subscribe to, you know, certain um, pro-life philosophies, um, she does it for the love of the game. And the name of the game is just her and her man and no one else. And maybe we can relate to that. Maybe some of us, but, but you know. Yeah. Just don't, uh, don't murder kids, maybe. But yeah, yeah. Don't stand in between me and my man. Yeah. I'm just kidding. People, that was the Ellen coming out. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's also it's a Criterion collection, so you can oh, find it, it. You can find it in the Criterion collection. Um, we got a few minutes left, Michael. Do you want to talk real quickly about another new release you saw? Yeah. Um, the movie I saw was Janet Planet. Um, I think it like kind of did festival stuff last year because it's technically a 2023 release. If you're looking at it. It's, like IMDb letterbox thing. But um, I just saw it in the theater here in Knoxville um, last week. And uh, it's uh, the debut feature film by Annie Baker, who I'm not familiar with, but I guess is a really well-regarded playwright. Um, and, uh, it's basically about um, this mother-daughter pair. Um, and uh, the mother is like an acupunct acupuncturist um, and the name of her practice is Janet Planet. Um, and it has that kooky name because she's living out in the rural Massachusetts in what seems to be a fairly thriving uh, kind of new age scene. Um, and uh, the daughter is 11 years old. And um, we the movie opens up with her like... Uh, calling her mom to take her home from camp because she like summer camp because um she doesn't feel connected to the kids um and wants to come home um and so like a lot of this movie is like the the daughter feeling really insecure and like not having friends and wanting to be around her mom while her mom kind of navigates a bunch of uh other adults coming in and out of her life the movie's kind of like cut into three uh, pieces and each piece is about a different adult that comes and lives with them. Um, two of which are kind of um, romantic interests for the mom. One of which is like an old friend. Um, and uh, like what I, I thought this was really good. Um, what I thought was striking about it is that um, there's a few things, but one it's um, it's really slow and spacious in this kind of gorgeous way. Uh, I Andrew's not here. So, I don't know if I can say that this is slow cinema. I don't think it is, but it's like edging up to that kind of like transcendental style sort of thing um, where there's a lot of, there's a lot of space given in the film to like soundscapes and kind of almost this like 
cathedral like feel of like natural spaces because a lot of the movie is like people walking around in the woods in these like massachusetts woods on dirt roads and stuff like that um there's a lot of really long takes of people just doing stuff um there's this one sequence where they go to like this kind of like um it may or may not be a cult theater troupe um who puts on this kind of like experimental play with like puppetry and weird masks for the characters and you just kind of watch this unspool for probably like five or six minutes without any real interaction from the characters that we know uh and there's a lot of that in the movie where the movie allows itself to just like open up into um just kind of unexpected rhythms um that end up being like i think really kind of beautiful just in terms of the the texture and aesthetic of the movie um but also um the mother and daughter are played by uh terrific actresses uh julian nicholson is the mother um who i've definitely seen before but i can't i can't quite place where i've seen her before um i'm looking she was in law and order criminal intent um okay but um she's really good as the mom um and uh, the daughter, especially Zoe Ziegler. Um, and this is, as far as I can tell, her first like feature film role. Um, she's been in like a couple short films or something, but she's incredible um, as this kind of weird kid who doesn't know how she fits in and kind of is forced to just like play spectator to a lot of adult things um, because of like she's not around other kids her age and is just having to be around her mom. Um, and, uh, she's really incredible. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very much like a kind of naturalistic indie movie. Um, but, uh, I think like what makes it distinctive or like I said, the, the, the really, um, spacious design of like the cinematic style. And then the, the two central actresses are both really great. So, um, if you can catch it, I think it's, it's a great theater experience because of um, just the sounds and the space and the meditative quality of, of the film. Um, but even if you have to catch it at home, um, it's worth your time if any of that sounds interesting. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was good. There's my lightning round on Janet Planet. Uh, in, my, in my quick cursory Googling of Annie Baker, do you know who her husband is? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. I forgot to, <laughs> to mention this, uh, but uh, she's married to Tracy Letts, right? No, that's uh, uh, Carrie Coons. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Tracy sorry. Letts. This is a uh, I'm crossing wires here. Yeah. Uh, Annie Baker's sure. is married to uh, Nico Bomback, who is Noah Bomback's younger brother. What? <laughs> Which I okay, thought was. Sorry, a... I did not know that. Never mind. Yeah. I was just like, oh, it's a Nico. And I was like, is that Noah's brother? I said, yeah. But he, and he kind of looks like a. Like a like a Bizarro Noah Bomback, so maybe this is like the <laughs> this is like the Bizarro Noah Bomback Greta Gerwig couple. It's like a whole different world of it. <laughs> Wild. Um, no, anyway, I did not know that. that's all I have so, to add to that. Uh, she won the Pulitzer Prize for mm -hmm. a play I've never heard of. Um, so. I don't we, know. She seems pretty good at this uh, movie making thing, so hopefully we, she makes another one. We ain't theater people here on the Cinematary Podcast. Dude, my, my really quick rant about theater is that oh. if they wanted more people to be theater people, they gotta do something outside of New York. Like, That's I can't go to fucking New York every time I want to see like a hot new play. The traveling companies, they exist. They come to the yeah. Tennessee Theater and they get, the tickets get bought up by like, you know, old age pensioners. and Yeah, but even then, the Tennessee money. Theater is not booking like the the Tennessee books thing. Tennessee Theater books things after they win all the awards and stuff. Yeah. Like I can't. Uh, there's not a scene that I can see like original dramas that I'm aware of here. Um, there's anyway. Sorry, that's my quick rant. Um, I isolate all our half theater listeners now. They're just like, ah, how dare they! I'm sorry, I just can't go up to New York to see a fair like, point. no like no name plays. Like Yeah, it's a fair point. I think maybe so. do do more like Fathom events or something. I don't know. That's uh, true. That's true. But yeah. Um, all right. Well, we're gonna take a quick break and then we're gonna be back uh trying to save our father and mother after we were separated in yet another uh and child sister. trafficking inc <laughs> incident uh <laughs> after this break.
And we're back with part two of episode 478 of Cinematary. In this part, we're going to be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movies series with 1954's Sancho the Bailiff, directed by Kenji Mizaguchi uh, from a script by Fuji Yahiro and Yoshikata Yoda. The film stars Kinyo, uh, Kinyo uh, Tanaka, Toshiaki Hanayagi, uh, Kyoko K- uh, Kagawa, and Itaro Shindo. While on a journey to visit their father, a banished governor, Zushio and Anju are attacked, separated from their mother, Tamaki, and sold as slaves to an estate managed by the brutal Sancho. The, the children grow up as slaves on the estate, but when Anju uh, hears a newly acquired slave singing, singing a song that mentions their names, they realize their mother may still be alive and make plans to find her. Uh, by the time of the film's release, Mizuguchi was nearing the end of his career, but enjoying a newfound recognition among Western critics. They discovered Japanese cinema via the triumph of Kurosawa's Rashomon at the 1951 Venice Film Festival and found more pleasures in Mizaguchi's film Ugetsu, which screened at Venice in 1953. Uh, Though Mizaguchi interspersed these sweeping historical epics with a series of brilliant modern-day dramas, it was the exotic tragedies of Japan's past that were snapped up by Western distributors. For English-speaking critics, Sancho the Bailiff confirmed the promise of Ugetsu that Mizaguchi was a master of visual storytelling, using flowing uh, camera movements and telescoped years uh, to craft tragedies of almost Shakespearean scope and gravity. Um, When Mizaguchi made Sancho the Bailiff in 1954, he set the story in an ancient era far removed from the democratic reforms Japan had nearly embraced under the American occupation. The film that cruelty repeats itself comes as no surprise. What shocks us is the realization that the current divider of families is the nation that taught the lessons of human rights to the post uh, post war world. Um, Mizaguchi denounced the wrongs of the Japanese military, but also put forth the concept of human rights as another name for the Buddhist value of compassion. Um, the film makes clear compassion. Uh, makes clear compassion is not a simple feeling of kindness or sympathy, but the active motivation to alleviate the suffering of an unrelated other without personal gain and with some risk to oneself. It is an emotion that occurs in a cluster of American and Japanese films set in the Second World War or inspired by its aftermath. Um, Mizuguchi's legacy comes, uh, or excuse me. Um, yeah, I think that's all I had from that. There wasn't a lot. Honestly, there's not a lot of info on this movie. Um, I, I'll, I'll mention this. We were just talking about it off mic. In 1990, uh, two producers commissioned Ter- Terrence Malick. Yeah, that Terrence Malick um, to write a stage play based on this movie. Um, and it started to kind of get some legs. Um, and then, But then when it was going to go to Broadway, it did not happen. So we missed out on a Terrence Malick adaptation of Sancho the Bailiff. Um, and then uh, not a lot of contemporary reviews, but this one from 2006 on a pro, uh, in the New Yorker um, profile on Mizuguchi film critic Anthony Lane wrote, quote, I have seen Sancho only once a decade a decade ago, emerging from the cinema, a broken man, but calm in my conviction that I had never seen anything better. I have not dared watch it again, reluctant to ruin the spell, but also because the human heart was not designed to weather such an ordeal word (laughs) yeah on that note let's talk a little bit about sancho the bailiff um this is my second time watching it i uh i kind of felt the same way as that guy i watched it the first time and it was a perfect setting it was like raining outside it was like middle of the day i was a little sleepy it put me asleep to sleep um for a little while which is a high compliment you know i'm I'm fully on the a pitch pong train of like you know movies that put you to sleep are like like that's like it was a good put to sleep Kurosami is the same way, but yeah, like, like it was, it was very much in that vein of like, I was so, I, I was so comforted by this very st- tragic movie that it put me to sleep the first time I watched it. Um, and I felt like it was pretty vindicated on the second viewing, but I know this was the first time for both of y'all. What did you, uh, what did you think of, um, what did you think of the movie, Grace? Cried my eyes out. <laughs> Like, it, I, you know, it just it just was very effective. Um, the brother sister dynamic. Um, she is his conscience. She is uh, um, Anju, the sister. She is his um, only other relative and connection to the life that they had. Um, and she reminds him of their past and she 
tragically takes her own life. Um, and that was really hard to watch. Co the constant suffering and the beatings and the pain and suffering of being isolated and passed back and forth between people um, was heartbreaking to watch. Um, very compelling acting by everyone. The pain and desperation in everyone's voices as they plead to other characters for a bit of mercy, for a bit of kindness, for a bit of empathy. It's so hard to watch because you just want to like grab these people and shake them and be like, help them, care about them. And that is, um, I feel like that's also the world that we live in now where um, we all need to give each other a little more empathy and kindness. Like we should be, you know, uh, working to alleviate the sufferings of others, of course, and other parts of the world and kind of dancing around it. But I mean, um, that's just the 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 activism, the the call for social change and activism. And it speaks very loudly to me. And um, I was very overwhelmed and I cried a lot. Michael. Awesome. Yeah, it's um it's a brutal movie. <laughs> like geez. <laughs> like in the first like uh 30 minutes um the the family gets separated from the patriarch because he's standing up for the rights of like the common people against this tyrant and then uh so he's he's exiled and then and that's a bummer and there's all the sad stuff with this family being separated and then like the mother gets separated from the kids by these like child traffickers who turn them into who who, who put them into slavery um and then it just gets worse from there. Like it's, it's like um, at the beginning of the movie, you know, the dad um, is like kind of parting shot to his kids is like this, um, this teaching um, that uh, without mercy, what is it? It's like without mercy, like human kind is like an animal or something like that. Um, so um, make sure that you show mercy to everyone. And like seeing that, I know not knowing anything about this movie, I was kind of anticipating the movie to be like a kind of morality tale in the sense of like, um, maybe the kids are going to grow up and want revenge and they have to like kind of grapple with like, how do we show mercy to our father's captors or whatever? No, what ends up happening is they show you the first part of that saying, which is that how monstrous humanity can be toward others. And they have to um, learn how to be kind people regardless of like the the horrific stuff that everybody is doing to them um like uh there's a part midway through the movie where the son um is kind of seems to be succumbing to like the brutality around him and he takes part in like a like uh basically like a sancho the the brutal slave slaver um like will brand people who he doesn't like um and who or, have like tried who, to escape yeah he tried um to like it's like a punishment basically and uh there's a part midway through the movie where um the son participates in one of those brandings and um everyone's like man i can't believe you would do that like and but then by the end of the movie he's kind of had to turn that around and like become like a better person than that and like that's i thought i was gonna see more of that in the movie where like the characters like grapple with the kind of morality of like oh i want to do something bad but i'm gonna do something good instead but instead it's withstanding the lack of mercy and that is just yeah. heartbreaking to watch like over the two hours that this movie is you're just seeing these characters like brutalize like over and over again um and but still trying like the struggle to remain strong to this kind of principle even though this principle seems to bear no fruit in their lives um initially and it's i don't know it, it was a major bummer i mean it's a great movie but uh difficult to watch in a way that i was not expecting yeah it's 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 definitely one that it's it's not like we're gonna you know we're, we're gonna it's gonna be brutal but then like we'll offer like a little inch of like hope and prosperity it's it's pretty like nope and even, even like the, the end even, even the, the end, end is like nope <laughs> <laughs> gosh <laughs> that's why i like it because i'm just like yeah like there is no little like little 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 sliver of like yeah there's a chance you're like nope 
it just sucks. Well, and it is, it is like, I mean, if you're going to have like a kind of moral principle in your life of like show mercy and kindness, no matter what, like that is only a meaningful stance if there's the no matter what part, right? Like if everyone is kind to you, it's easy to be like a kind and nice person, but like it's so much harder to hold on to this idea that people should be merciful to others if all you ever experience from the world is just brutality. Um, and there's kind of like an amazing part near the end when like through a turn of events, like um, the son becomes like the governor um, and he immediately is like, I'm going to basically break the law and like forcibly free all these slaves. Um, and that's all I'm going to do in my position of power is that I'm going to immediately resign after freeing all these slaves. Um, and that is, is really fascinating um, because it's kind of where like the political element meets like the kind of personal morality element of it. Um, but that's like only, but I don't know, like the, like personal morality is only meaningful if it's not abstract like that. Like it has to be like uh, in opposition to something like uh, immoral or brutal and, um, and then even then it can only really be like uh like materially meaningful for those around you if you have some sort of power in order to like enforce it and others and i don't know like it is kind of interesting to think about like how dedicated to like the project of human rights and like human dignity this movie is and how misaguchi is dedicated to that uh, in the context of like what he kind of you know saw as like a japanese person in the first part of the 20th century before world war ii um, because in a way, I, he, you know, he's not in a position of political power, like the son, but like as someone who like lives through the war and then is in a position to then be almost like an ambassador of like Japan to like the broader world, like, you know, as Japan, like kind of becomes a more global, um, you know, integrated globally with like the West. Well, and, um, and, and clearly like, this is a moment when this movie comes out where, like Western audiences are paying more attention to like Japanese films. Right. And like the, the, the choice of after having like experienced like what, you know, Japan was like as an Imperial power um, and the kind of horrific like brutality that that was then being able to say like, well, this is what we as Japan are going to like be for. And I, um, like I said, it's not the same thing as becoming governor and freeing the slaves, but it is like an interesting, like kind of mirror of like, we've kind of been through this crucible of suffering um, and coming out the other side, enacting, you know, this, this uh, principle of like, kind of like basic, like human goodness. Mm -hmm. um, that's interesting to me. I think that this appeals to a Western audience, like given the time frame, this is like right at the early days of the civil rights movement and America we've been living through like Jim Crow South. And so to watch um, another country struggle with the same sort of human rights problem, human rights issue of slavery and oppression, trafficking of people, um, I think that um, to see that then reflected back on, to see it, you know, for us to like view, reflect and, hey, that's wrong. And um, we hate that. We don't like that. It did the right thing. I think that um, Western audiences would pick up on that. Um, American audiences would pick up on that and then sort of pat themselves on the back for look how far we've come. Like, we're not like that anymore without really realizing like, mm, we still kind of got a long way to go. Um, I mean, we did, uh, you know, drop two nukes on, japan after a war so uh you know i don't know it is interesting that, that this like makes inroads with like you know america i guess like you know in the cold war like human rights is kind of like what the west like claims to like kind of stake its legitimacy on you know um and at the same time like a lot of like actual really you know horrible atrocities are committed by like specifically the United States, like in this, like in the fifties and, you know, as like, you know, the struggle with the Soviet union kind of takes part on like, uh, it, along like the decolonization lines and stuff like that. Um, and 
there is like a kind of i mean it's kind of like a huge lie of like the latter half of the 20th century of america which is that like oh america is about the flourishing of human rights within liberal democracy and um in reality like that's not who we were outside of the united states at all and arguably not even within the united states um and so maybe like there is a sort of like flattery that like i'm curious like is like i wonder if, if people at the time saw this as like oh wow japan's finally coming around to our way of doing things you know being moral yeah. i don't know like is there a kind of like you know self-deception there with american audiences oh yeah like western audiences kind of going like they looks can... rough over there yeah. sure i'm like, glad we don't have any problems yeah. with uh causing suffering yeah. um kind of uh jumping back over to the movie i want to talk a little bit about uh one of the things that get, gets highlighted with it is the cinematography by Kazu Miyagawa. Um, and this dude has an insane resume because you have, you have this movie, but you also in, in a number of other Mizuguchi movies, including Ugetsu also worked with um, Kurosawa. He was the cinematographer on Rashomon on oh, no Yojimbo. Way, yeah. um, it worked with Ozu on floating weeds um, was the, was the cinematographer on the, 1971 version of silence um like just a just a like like the resume for him was absolutely insane and um you think about it, like that's that's kind of the thing that lingers you know we talk about like how brutal this movie is but th like like there's something about like the images in it that are so um there's something so like appealing in like a like just in like the framing in the in like how the, he sets up the shots um it's it's, it's incredibly most... controlled um, yeah especially if you compare it to um like some some kurosawa for instance can be like um it almost feels a uh, chaotic is the wrong word but there's there's an element where like the action kind of seems to be like almost um the camera is like running to keep up with like what's going on on screen whereas this one the camera is at such a remove like some of the scenes of violence and stuff are in like one take where the camera is pretty far away from what's happening mm -hmm. well and, and like it's 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 easily the most tragic part of the movie and it's the most infamous shot but the shot of anju walking into the into the water oh man um it, it evoked to me just in terms of like how it's how it's kind of framed it's framed within like these kind of trees and foliage it reminds me a lot of of shelly winters underwater in night of the hunter mm -hmm. um but and it also just kind of has that haunting quality to it because you don't get a you, you know it's it's pretty wordless like she just like she walks off and then the next time you go back to her it's it's in that shot that static shot and just it's there as she just slowly like goes deeper and deeper into the water and it cuts away and then it cuts back and it has the kind of like bubbles and it's gone. Um, yeah. There's also the, um, uh, speaking of water, like early in the film when the kids are taken from their mom, that oh, yeah. also happens on water and you see like from a very like pretty far away remove, like the kind of struggle on the boat, um, boats, I guess there's more than one. Um, and that's another one where you kind of like go back to it's not it's not as calm as that because there's like you know screaming and stuff going on but like it is a real like the framing of it is such that like outside of the boats it's just like, the frame is just like occupied by like water and mm -hmm. it's it's really like isolating feeling like there's no one that's going to help these people uh, as their family is being like torn apart and then like trafficked um, and I it, feel like there's just like a lot of really stark stuff like that, where like the, the kind of negative space within the frame is used to, um, really emphasize the, the ways in which like people don't come to the aid of the folks who are being, um, you know, subjected to these horrible things. Yeah. There's definitely like a level to people like, like he, he's really good at kind of like p putting people on different planes, Yeah, you know, like I think about the shot when, uh when it was zoshiro zishiro i just read it i should know zushio excuse me zushio. zushio uh whenever he gets to the chief like the the chief advisor 
um to the house and he's like on the like they're up in an elevated like in the house walking through the hallways and he's like below them like trying to grab their attention like through the railing of like a stair or something like yeah and he's just like that he's so like and he's so much like lower than everybody else it almost looks like he's like trying to like leap up and these are like eight foot tall people i'm i'm just having like a thought like thinking of like the two sides of uh or the two different um nature or natural um, backdrops with like the water, how that seems to like block out everything. And it fills up the whole frame. Like when Anju was like walking down to the water, it just looked like a blank. I didn't, I couldn't see anything. And I didn't realize that it was water. It was all just fairly brightly lit um, through all of the trees. And then I was also thinking about the scene where the family starts their journey and they're walking through the really tall grass. Um, And it seems like it's the, um, it suggests like this really tall grass, it like protects them, it hides them and it gives them shelter. So it's like the natural like greenery and and forest like gives, whereas like the water takes, Um, the water took Anju's life and then the big tsunami that wiped out other people. Um, The water separates um, the children from their mother. Like it, it, it's, I don't, I was, I just started thinking about that and like how that seems to be framed and like, yeah, how these natural mountainsides are, you know, it's a. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they like what I have to say. <laughs> um, the um, like the these um, more natural um, backdrops of like the mountains and and um, these are places for them to go. But then with the water, they're just it stops. Like civilization stops there, and then it's yeah. just water um, i'm thinking about like the scene when the mom the mother's taken away because it doesn't like it doesn't seem like they've like rowed out too far like they, it's not like they've gone like it doesn't feel like they've gone very deep but like because of the way he shoots it like he's he's on land shooting out and they're like out there on the water and then the kids are back on the land and like just the whole like the the tragedy of the struggle where the mom's like struggling with the two men and the, and then the servant like they like kind of hit back and the servant falls off and and drowns like it's just like because like you're so like far removed from it like it's like you kind of just like you as the viewer almost and as the audience member almost feel like helpless because it's not you don't feel like close to it where it feels like much more like like in your face it's like it's it's at a distance and you feel like like it, it's just more like there was no way to help that. Yeah, I think which like fits into that kind of um, like the the moral, you know, the 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 kind of philosophy that the father extends to them, and because like there's um there's kind of like an underwritten or like an unspoken assumption that like you have the ability to like show mercy to people, uh, but for a lot of this movie what happens to people is outside of anyone's control except for the people who are doing the atrocity, you know, like there's no way to prevent um, this like kidnapping except for the evil people to simply have not done that. And like, there is, I think for a lot of like evil and suffering in the world, there is like that feeling of like inevitability. Like I have no ability to, God, sorry. It's inevitable. No. It's out of your hands. You can't stop it. I can't, yeah. I can't stop it. Uh, uh, show some mercy, please. But I, I think that, like you were saying, Zach, like the remove of the camera in a lot of these scenes does like, um, give that feeling of like we're watching these from these atrocities from afar, um, and obviously as audience, an audience, we can't do anything to stop it anyway. But like it accentuates it by like removing us visually from it um as well and that's like a hard thing about like if you care about there being mercy in the world and you watch other people um you know being um you know treated cruelly by others but you have no ability to do anything about it like that that in itself is a kind of like angst um and pain that i think this movie evokes pretty effectively yeah you think about like the moments like you're describing, but then also like the moments when they're branding people. The first person is the uh, Nakiji, the the woman who kind of like shows some empathy toward Anju when she first gets there, and like she sees Anju and it like reminds her of her children that she's you know left back at home, um, 
and so like she kind of like has like has a breakdown and is just like you know i want to go back and see my kids and it makes like a you know a break to escape and of course they capture her and like it's like this is it, you the you don't see them like putting the brand on the person but you're definitely like closer to like that action than you are to like um you know the servant before falling into the water and drowning like you know it's it's one of those where she's below the camera and you see the person like do that and and you hear her screams and so like that you know that reaction to kind of trying to break away from you know the 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 shackles around you is very it's that's much more like in the forefront than a lot of the other uh a lot of the other moments um yeah stuff happens from afar i was thinking about the fire too how you know they just watch as mm -hmm. um they as as it all burns and yeah good point they, they don't intervene um you guys were saying also earlier about how um the cinematographer fills up a frame it, it like there's always sort of something happening um a little removed from um the action up at the front i'm thinking about um folks walking across you know, um, just in view through an open window or um, when the dancers, like the girls come um, and file into Sancho's or, or Sancho's um, house space um, when that other government official uh, yeah, yeah. came in and you can kind of see them kind of filter in and the actions happening all around. Um, so everything is very full of life and those are also events that are happening that are just out of our reach as well that we can't intervene with either um so it's yeah. like well while, while um you know our main struggle or our main focus is on this suffering there's always other suffering or there's always other um there's always something other going on um and so i think that that does a really nice job of like it, it can be really hard to to keep up with um, the world around you as yeah. well. So it just, it just, yeah. It well, isolates them and pulls focus and yeah. Yeah. Well, in what you're describing, it reminds me of the scene when Taro, the Sancho's son who kind of like helps Zushio and, uh, and, and Anju like briefly when they first get there, like you, like that scene where he leaves the camp, and it goes into like that large wide shot of like the mountain and like the road. And you just see him like walking down the road. Like that's, that's, that's the shot of him leaving. It's kind of like this whole expansive Valley um, that he's kind of walking into compared to that very insulated, like clo closed in space. That is the camp. I was, did we, I thought he would come back. I was kind of waiting <laughs> for him to like come back. You know, he comes he riding. Bails. In. He's he like, just nah. bails. But no, that, I mean like he ends this cycle so that's like a father-son dynamic and he ends the cycle of his you know father's reign and brutality and then um zushio he you know picks up um his father's mantle and carries on that legacy so i i think that that, that those are um two interesting um dynamics or two interesting sort of parallels um you know like Zushio's father is a man whose philosophy, Michael, like you said, bears no fruit in, in his life, but it's his afterlife where people are kind to him and they place flowers on his grave and speak kindly of him and remember him. Um, so, so, you know, the, the father son dynamics are, um, they're brief, but um, I, I was interested in those as well. Um, and, and, that, and that that point reminds me of like yeah you have this kind of father son dynamic but you also especially with like the central family you have you know the the father acting and that leads to he's exiled he's like put away in prison but it doesn't seem like he's like put into any any sort of any sort of similar situation to the the, the kids and the mo mother and so like he acts and his actions lead to them being, you know, cast out and eventually sold into slavery where the mom is, is so, you know, kind of sold to this one farm or this one camp to be like a concubine and the kids are there to like work. Um, and then, you know, they get a little older. Zushio's like, you know, 
finally like literally like towards the last moment it's just like no like you're right we need to escape and anju kind of going you know yeah you go you go um and like it seems you know not that the because the mother doesn't die but like in both cases like the 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 women to the side of the father and the son you know the mother and the daughter kind of getting the brunt you know you know but in both cases like i said the mother doesn't die but you know she doesn't have an easy time and is not found in like a great situation at, near the end of the movie she and doesn't the same get to An- be a governor no <laughs> even for a, even for a few days and then yeah. anju you know what else is she supposed to do like they're gonna just torture her to death if she goes back there so she take she's like this is the only real path that i have because you know I want, you know, I want to, I want to save the life of this other person and, and, and I'm not going to go back to that camp because they're just going to kill me. Her death was especially hard to watch. Like hers, like the least violent and her taking her own life. Well, especially because initially she's the one who's going to run away. And yeah. so you think that she's going to be the one who's going to be okay. Like she's going to escape and do whatever. And then there's this reversal. Um, that's just it's just harrowing yeah. um any final thoughts on sancho the bailiff before we uh we wrap up i said this off camera but why is it called sancho the bailiff you had a theory you gotta I, say that theory okay and so my theory was that um sancho the bailiff is the antithesis of uh of the fathers of zushio and anju's um He's the antithesis of their father's philosophy, and he is a very formidable um, villain um, and an obstacle that they have to overcome. So I guess he is given the titular. He is he is the title, and I don't the like it. The role, it's the titular role, and I don't like it. I don't think that he deserves it. Um, but he, him, his. He is the. He's also the um, face that they can put to this oppression and and um, moral failing of slavery and trafficking. So I guess he also gets to be the name. He's the. He's he's the obstacle that they overcome. Um, but I, I think it would have been. I mean, it couldn't have been the adventures of Zushio and Anju. Um, because that that's a terrible, terrible title. That's yeah, terrible. It like I, the, well, I didn't. It's the not my curious I case. It, but, of... <laughs> and that would also be misleading. But I just hated yeah. that it was called Sancho the Bailiff because I'm like, who's the, you know, <laughs> who, who is he's, he? He's going to be cute? some cool like, guy. Yeah. Cool, you know? but, I think I also had different associations with what a bailiff is than uh, oh, what yeah. this movie does. Like, I, bailiff I'm is really like second away. tier, like court official <laughs> in my mind. Whereas yeah. in this, in this case, he's like a ruthless dictator who owns like a, a slave operation. I also want to say, you know, yes, we've had two straight episodes with prominent themes of child trafficking in them. But I think we can firmly say that the Cinematary podcast is against child trafficking. Like that's not that's true. Depiction does not equal endorsement on the <laughs> Cinematary podcast. That being said, it's been a lot of child trafficking lately. Um, Quite a bit. We would, uh, it's, been, it's been a while. That. It's been a while since I saw Lawrence of Arabia, but I don't think there's any in there. I'm not going to say no. We don't know. There's a there's a lot of movie to fit child trafficking in. It's in, almost uh, four Lawrence hours Arabia. long. Yeah, yeah, like you know, who knows? Might throw in a little uh, just as a treat, you know. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com/slash/cinematary, on Twitter and Instagram at handle at Cinematary, and on Letterbox at letterbox.com/slash/cinematary, where we list the movies that we talked about in this episode. Um, if you'd like to support the show, patreon.com slash cinematary. We thank uh, our patrons for supporting the show. Uh, thank you to Cam, Ron Hayes, Tanner Huskins, Teresa Marsathi, and Tyler Chandler. Uh, thank you so much for your patronage. Uh, as Michael alluded to, next week or next episode, we're going to be uh, co- finally covering. It's, you know, we've been doing this for 479 episodes now, finally covering 1962's Lawrence of Arabia. Um, and we're going to have a special guest. Grace, do you want to talk about our special guest a little bit? 
Sure. My dad is going to join us on the podcast. Um, if any of you have watched previous episodes, um, especially from the Young Critics Watch series, I have sprinkled in the fact that um, my dad is responsible for this uh, love and devotion that I have to cinema. Um, and he has a lot of fabulous stories about his um, movie going experience. Um, tales from the projector's booth. Um, so he, he's got a lot of um, insight and a lot of passion to give to this series. And Lawrence of Arabia is his favorite movie ever. He's been calling me up asking, when are we recording? So he's ready. So he will bring his A game and hopefully we will all deliver as well. And hopefully this will be a fun and enjoyable episode for everyone involved. Well, right now I'm the only person on the episode with y'all. So I hope I bring my A game is really the... That's really more the question, but I, I'm excited. This is one, you know, this is kind of one of those that you expect. I'm, you know, we've held off for a while, but I'm really excited. I haven't seen this in a while. I just bought literally a couple hours ago, bought the 4K uh, 60th anniversary edition of it. Going to pop that in. I'm pumped. Maybe the most necessary for a 4K release. That's what I thought. Of all time. Yeah. You know what? I'm probably I'm gonna have a hell of right now. My my Fourth of July plans are watch Lawrence of Arabia and then screw it. Let's watch Heat. America, <laughs> America the the two the two American movies, a British I, movie not, and an American movie. <laughs> not necessarily that Lawrence of Arabia is an American movie. I just I just I think I think about Heat so much. There's a lot of heat in Lawrence of Arabia too. I'm it's never true. not thinking about heat. I mean, I've I've got heat. We might flashes. I don't know I don't know what the series will be or the but we might have to have a heat episode. I'm just gonna be honest. A Michael we, Mann series. If 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 the if Bill Simmons can have like five episodes of the rewatchables where he's you know talking about heat and he talks out of his ass all the time, I think we can at least have one. We gotta That's do all. that. Anyway. I have a lot to say about heat too. Right. If you can't take the heat. Get out of the desert, Lawrence of Arabia. That's that's our <laughs> that's our tagline for next episode. Until until then, thanks for listening, and we'll see you. <laughs>